Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you all here. Yeah. It's nice to, uh, for some of you who are sitting outside, especially those in San Diego, <laughs> are showing me that big California sky. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, let's just take a moment here and welcome each other into the room. And then to welcome ourselves, to welcome our highest nature forth. And so let's begin by just taking some deep breaths, going inward. Maybe helpful to close your eyes and just to notice that which is good about your presence, that which is holy, that which is divine. And so just breathing in and breathing out, feeling. Feeling what's here. Feeling what's alive in this moment. And being compassionate. Feeling or acknowledging whatever's struggling. And so just noticing that which is good, that which is awake, right here and right now. And noticing that which is struggling. So any part of you that's struggling, I'm going to invite you just to soften there. to soften. And to give yourself permission just to feel the spacious nature of your mind. How oh, there is a peace here, a space here, a freedom that's here a stillness that's here. To feel and directly experience this gentle love in your heart. You can even smile a little bit. Go, oh, I have a good heart. <laughs> God gave me a good heart. There's something tender here, just feeling that tenderness. And gently inviting the tenderness to spread out throughout your body. To spread out. To become alive and radiant. And then taking one more deep, full breath. And just noticing this quiet power, strength in the belly. Perhaps a feeling there's this mountain, mountain of emptiness, this quiet, profound strength. rooted into the earth. And just smiling at the recognition that you are divine in human form. 
You are divine. You are divinity in human form. Just to smile at how, how beautiful that is. How beautiful it is. And so if you like, you can open your eyes. But the big thing is I want you to stay with your direct experience. To stay with your direct experience. And so this week's inquiry question is a very simple one. Is what is your experience of being? What is your experience of being? So what is your experience of this presence that you are? And the beautiful thing about an inquiry question is they work in any moment. So if you're having a terrible time, a difficult time with your body, with your nervous system, if you have a splitting headache or you know, some difficulty at work, if you're sitting in traffic or in um, one of these, I'll call them coronavirus lines, you know, where you have to wait in a long line to to go into the store, wait in a long line to get some food to eat. You know, if your normal business isn't open, we're not allowed, allowed just to walk in and out. And you're sitting there and you can ask this question, what is my experience of being? And the first answer that may comes forward is, I'm irritated, <laughs> I'm angry. I'm hurting. But then you ask the question again, what is my experience of being? I'm softening. I'm beginning to let go. I'm seeing the thoughts are not real. I'm seeing that this human body, this human experience is a temporary thing not to be taken so seriously. Oh, good. Then you take another deep breath. And you ask the question again, what is my experience of being? And then you may get this glimpse of spaciousness that's holding you and all the other people <laughs> wearing face masks, standing in a line in the hot sun or whatever it is. And you take another deep breath. And you find yourself connecting with the felt presence of your heart. The felt presence of your heart. And so these questions that I offer each week, they're meant to be asked uh, in a repetitive fashion. And that will help to take you deeper each time you ask a question. You know, in the past they've been Questions oftentimes more geared toward healing. Like, who do I need to forgive? What can I forgive right now? But this week's question is, what is your, what is my experience of being? Right here, right now. And so a question like this can help get you out of the trance of mind. The trance of mind. And help bring you into the truth of your experience. You know, this week, uh, actually j just the other day here in the United States, there's, they're starting to to play sports again. And I noticed myself uh, having a little bit of a cathartic experience. And when my wife told me that, 
you know, they're going to start playing hockey again. And I said, no, that's not true. I can't believe it. I'm not really a big sports fan, but I might watch, you know, four or five hockey games a year, especially as it gets closer to the Stanley Cup. But I've been, been really noticing just how on edge everyone is. How on edge. And people have been just absolutely losing their minds. I think I told this incident uh, during the Wednesday night meditation, but perhaps I didn't. But uh, this last week here in uh, my, the little town that I live in, we have this little bakery and um, one of the cashiers who was working the register uh, asked a, uh, a customer, you know, hey, could you put your mask on? Uh, we're required to ask you to do that when you walk in. And a fella got out his gun and pointed it at her, you know, and said something silly, like, I'm an American, I can do what I want, or, you know, something crazy. And we're just, we're on edge. And if people are, have, we're fed up with the rules, we're fed up with being locked down, with our lives being disrupted. People have gotten highly political, you know, around uh, everything wearing a silly mask. <laughs> Somehow this become a political statement to wear one or to not wear one. And, you know, one of the things that I noticed within my own consciousness when I sat down and, and watched some hockey, I can't even remember who it was. I think it was the Canadians versus um, all the Penguins. And, you know, sports on TV, I mean, sports in general, it's like the ultimate play of samsara. It's just, <laughs> we pick a made up side and we root for one team like it means something. But part of being human is honoring the fact that we are divine, these absolute divine creatures. So this question, what is your experience of being, points you to. But the flip side of being human is honoring the fact that you're an animal, literally an animal. And human animals, they, they like to fight. They like to argue. They like to, you know, go like this, like two rams. In the most gross sense, we shoot each other with guns and drop bombs on each other. But in a, a more maybe <laughs> toned down sense, we align with political parties and just are ready to rip each other's heads off you know, over wearing a mask. It, it's such nonsense, it's such craziness. But what one of the things that really touched my heart when I saw uh, sports come back on TV is I saw that human beings, they don't know what to do with their anger. They don't know what to do with their angst. And it can actually be helpful for them to go and uh, watch the gladiators fight, you know, back like in the times of the Romans. The gladiators fight or whoever it was that fought the lions, I think it was the Christians, <laughs> the poor Christians that have fight the lions and been for their lives. You know, there's something about watching a fight, watching sports that helps us work out some of our anger. And, and my God, is it such a greater way than attacking each other over a face mask than hating each other over political parties. At least with sports, we know it's imagined. You know, we know it's imagined. We know it doesn't make a difference who wins. But it literally brought tears to my eyes just yesterday. I felt this great sigh of relief and that people could sit on the couch and let their angst out over <laughs> a blue team versus a white team. 
you know, one of the ways we work on doing this is sitting down in meditation and giving ourselves permission to look at our angst, look at our fear, look at our unconsciousness, and to work with it through breathing into it, through facing it through facing it. And as a human being, it's interesting, most people don't have consciousness of this, but most of us walk, walk around and we're like a bottle of Coke that has been you know, sh shook up. It has all this pressure in it and it wants to explode. And when we sit down and meditate, in a sense, what we're doing is we're, we're taking the cork, we're taking the cap off. And letting that energy flow up the spine, out the top of the head. Letting it flow out our bottom. Let it flow out our feet, out our fingertips. And if we don't do this as a human being, if we don't know how to release our emotions, we will literally go mad. <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. And so this poor fella who got out his gun and pointed in the face of this young girl, at a cash register, that's a moment of insanity. You know, having a 20 year old girl tell you, hey, can you wear your mask, please? <laughs> if that's a reason to get out your gun and put it in someone's face. You know, it's a sign of the times right now, just how crazy everyone is becoming. How crazy. how outrageous it's become. Everyone needs to learn to breathe. Everyone needs to learn how to relax. Everyone needs to learn how to soothe and comfort their own emotions. And to the degree that we can do this is to the degree that we stay sane. But if we cannot soothe what's within us, if we cannot take the backward step and step into something greater, we're going to be doomed as a planet, literally. Literally. And so anyways, um, so I was glad to see <laughs> sports come back on TV. So people who do not have skills. <laughs> They can just allow their angst to be work, worked out in a TV, you know, in an arena <laughs> where the consequences, you know, aren't great, aren't great. Let it get worked out in a play, in a play. But for those of us who are awake, can we invite our heart to heal? our heart to respond with compassion, our heart to knock down the walls and just let whatever is within us unravel so that we can simply abide empty and free. And one of the great mistakes that many meditators make is instead of opening, relaxing and releasing, a lot of meditators, they sit down and they control and control more and more and more. <laughs> and the more they control, the more tense they become. And then when they're done meditating, you know, they just kind of feel like a powder keg, you know, or a bottle of Coca-Cola that's been knocked over and kicked down the street and it's just ready to explode. We have to learn how to work with our human self or we'll never be free. Never be free. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, one, one announcement is I'm, I've recently been putting together uh, a short video series. There's a short, um, you know, short videos between seven and maybe 12 minutes that have to do with working with emotions. Uh, that's one series, work with basically difficult, difficulties on the path. And another uh, set of practices, glimpse practices, where I'm gonna invite you just to step back into the peace, the spaciousness of the mind, the tenderness and love of the heart and the strength of the belly. And just short practices, 
you know, one of my uh, colleagues, Locke Kelly, he teaches these short practices, and I found them very helpful along the way. He used to say this thing, um, something like short glimpses, you know, glim short glimpse, glimpses many times throughout the day. And when you have these little glimpses throughout the day, and you do it again and again and again, like noticing the peace that's here now. Just stepping back into the peace. And then maybe you go into work and you forget all about it. And then at 10.15, you know, you stub your toe at work. And then you hear the practice again. Step into the peace. And you give yourself permission just to step back. And when you do this re repeatedly throughout the day, it starts to break up that grip that the ego has on our consciousness. The grip that the ego has on our identity. And so anyways, um, if you're interested, look for those on YouTube. And um, it looks like um, our friend Richard has a question and so uh, I'm going to invite Richard forward, but also I'm going to remind everyone else in the Sangha that Richard doesn't have to be the only brave one <laughs> to ask a question or leave a comment. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear from the rest of you as well. So Richard, uh, what's on your mind tonight? Hey everyone. Um, Facebook too. Um, Craig, my question tonight is, I think, related to my question last time. I asked about a mature relationship with Kundalini. I would like to uh, today ask about a mature relationship or a, what, what does a mature spiritual practitioner in general look like? Um, and I feel like that's a late, related maturity, also mastery mastery on the spiritual path as distinct related but distinct from awakening itself so you got people awakening i wouldn't necessarily call them mature practitioners right i um right right, right. and so there is a relationship there um for sure but i'm just curious in the maturity aspect thank you yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful question. I'm sorry, I just had to burst out laughing there uh, <laughs> because it is true what, what Richard said, that, that there's many people who are waking up on the path and, you know, then they get into the syndrome uh, that Ajashanti calls, I got it, I lost it. And the reason we get it is because at one point we are sincere. And the reason we lose it um, is oftentimes because of immaturity. Now, now, let me take that down a notch because that may sound a little harsh. It's common on the path to, to wake up and then to have all of your wounds and pain and confusion come forward, which when you do face that, you develop maturity, you develop wisdom, you develop strength. But what happens with a lot of people is, you know, they wake up and then they become overwhelmed with the onslaught of emotion and wound that comes forward, that they immediately go into their ego and they blame themselves, which is an immature action. They attack themselves, which is an immature action. I could use a different word, unhelpful action. And then they just engage in fighting themselves and then grasping at this once pot of gold of consciousness that they had and blaming themselves for not being there anymore. And so one of the hallmarks of maturity is having a sense of humanity. And by that, I mean, you know, a deep humility an acknowledgement of the human condition and not being shocked by it, not being shocked by it. And let me see if I can speak to that a little bit more. 
there's a lot of people who are shocked by their own ego, by what's within them, the, the, the layers and levels of darkness within them. And the hallmark of a, a, a long time meditator is when you sit for long periods of time, you will open to immense worlds of brilliance, love, light, compassion, peace, but simultaneously, you will open to immense worlds of darkness, of hell, of confusion within your own consciousness. And someone who's, who's spent a lot, long time in meditation, they just know this. It's just like, oh, yeah, I can find greed within me, lust within me, um, cowardice within me, failure within me, judgment within me. And when you've sat with that again and again and again, you're no longer shocked by it. You're not so disturbed by it. You realize, yeah, you know, the greatest love is within this consciousness, along with the darkest, hellish confusion <laughs> is within me too. It's actually a, a realization of oneness, by the way, is, is we're one with everything. You know, not that which is, not only are we one with that which is holy, we're one with that which is dark and difficult. And oftentimes maturity comes through humbly sitting with your human self and meeting it with love. When you meet your human self with love, what happens is, is you begin to... Um, file down the sharp edges, you know, the places where you lash out, where you fight, where you want to attack or blame or judge or get super excited, you know. Um, I know I say this often, but I'll say it again. You know, my wife was always telling me, it's like her big complaint. She said it to me a couple times a week, you don't get excited about anything. I'm like, I don't, I don't get excited about much, you know, I don't get excited about much. And oftentimes with maturity, you find you, you experience everything in a much fuller capacity, but you don't jump up. You just, you don't jump all over the place when you see something on the news. You don't become so excited by a riot, a protest about, you know, something Trump did or, you know, what, whatever it is. You know, when you see a fool being a fool, you just, <laughs> you just smile and say, oh yeah, that's a human. And you can find that fool within yourself and you can see it on the TV screen. And you know, a, ma a mature one, basically, they become what would I call mostly immovable. Mostly Im immovable. You know, we don't want to become totally static, you know, like a stone Buddha, because then we're not awake, you know, to what's happening in the relative world. But mostly immovable means we're connected to this mountain of emptiness. And the more and more you connect to this mountain of emptiness, there's a quiet quality of trust there. So that even in your human self, like I was speaking about in the beginning of the satsang, if you feel really bad in your body, you can still be awake. If, you know, life is throwing you turmoil and confusion. You know, uh, uh, about a, two months ago, I can't remember how long ago, but about two months ago, life threw me, you know, one of the hardest, probably the hardest thing it's ever thrown at me. Something that happened to my family. Uh, and, and I, you know, I was stunned but I was also immovable. I just sat 
and I cried and let the tears, the anger, the sadness just flow through my body, flow through my nervous system. It was also flowing through my family. The shock, the trauma, the pain. I just stayed, just stayed put. And so this is maturity is we just stay put. And you wait and you listen deeply for the, appro the appropriate reaction. So the sign of immaturity is reactivity. It's reactivity. And we have to be careful with this teaching because my teacher taught me this in the beginning, basically to be non-reactive. But the way my spiritual superego took it was, I just kind of clamped everything down within my consciousness and didn't allow myself to feel anything. And so that's not being a Buddha, <laughs> that's being repressed. <laughs> and so the trick is, is can you feel and experience everything and not move until the truth tells you to move. And if we want to wake up in a masterful way, we have to know this skill. We have to adopt it. And this, you know, will take, you know, five, 10, 15 years, a lifetime <laughs> to master, to master. And the beautiful thing about, um, mastery is because people in our culture, we have, you know, all these great mythological stories of mastery. And the way the story is told is that they're told in a, a perfectionist way. And, and mastery is not um, perfectionism. So I want to be crystal clear about that. You know, one of the foundations of mastery is, is humility, like I said. So mastery has room to admit that we're human. We have an evolving edge. There's always going to be a place inside where I can look, where I can grow. You know, where I can be sanded down and smoothed out. Where I can learn to, you know, become more conscious of how I speak, how I act how I relate, what my biases are. And so it has this hallmark of humility. And again, it's not shocked. Like I'm never shocked when I find something, you know, dark arise out of my consciousness. I say, oh yeah, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> I'm not shocked by the things I see in the news because I find those same things within my own self. Those same things. And when you have this softness and this non-judgmental attitude toward your human self, this creates the perfect ground for an abiding awakening to give birth. Because abiding awakening likes there to be room within you. As soon as you're judging and attacking yourself or being reactive, there's no room. In order to be reactive, you have to fabricate a self really quickly. And so, you know, to be reactive, it could be something fun like, you know, you're sitting there watching TV, totally spaced out. You see some crazy violent act on the news. And immediately you run in the streets and you think you need to be breaking windows of someone's shop that, you know, or spitting on police or screaming at police. And maybe that's the truth. Or maybe something just become, became fabricated within you. When you sit back and you let the reactivity dissolve, you may find that your response is quite different to the same thing you saw on TV. You might find that you may walk across the political aisle and have a conversation where you first listen before you scream or you may you know if you're a sheepish sheepish person <laughs> you may, might find yourself speaking a little more firmly and having a stronger boundary 
You know, sometimes that's what mastery means. My teacher was very firm with me. <laughs> many times, you know, many times. But I knew when he was being firm, it was the truth speaking. I knew what he was saying was truthful. It wasn't reactive. If I did something really stupid, he was not reactive. But he certainly was firm. He didn't let me get away with anything. And so anyways, um, that was a beautiful question. Beautiful question, Richard. Uh, and, and again, I, I laugh because we are in a very interesting time right now, 2020. You know, people who have no idea about spiritual awakening. You know, some people are just spontaneously waking up. And they're being shocked by the immensity of brilliance and beauty and freedom. But then, you know, most of those folks who are, you know, spontaneously waking up, you know, because of something they saw or <laughs> heard on YouTube or whatever it was. I, I love it. You know, when I was a kid, they didn't have a YouTube, you know, but you can watch a teacher on YouTube and have a non-dual awakening experience. But that if you cannot um, maintain it, if you, can, you cannot step fully into it and abide as that, don't be discouraged. You know, don't say, oh, Craig's calling me immature. No, say, I'd like to connect more deeply with myself. I'd like to investigate my wound, my shadow. You know, these are the veils that veil the awakening. I'd like to sit with a teacher and develop a relate a relationship with the teacher. You know, in order to have something abide, we have to learn how to stay put and not just stay put in our ego. We have to learn how to stay put in the depth of our being. And so one of the greatest ways of learning to stay put is you get in contact with a good teacher, a good song, a good community. And if you, if you live in an isolated place in the world is to, you know, just to make this the highest, you know, the highest priority on our list. You know, for me, it, that's all I wanted was just to be free. Just to be free. I didn't even really know, know what freedom was. <laughs> I just I want to be free. I want to be free. And I didn't let anything get in my way. And so that's the other thing with um, the people who go through this syndrome of, I got it, I lost it. Oftentimes they, um, they just don't have their priorities right. From the grace of God, they wake up. And through the grace of ego, they go back to sleep. <laughs> but, but, you know, we all have the grace of God. We also all have the grace of ego. But when you know what your life is about, the grace of ego, you know, can't topple you as easily. When you know who you are and what your life's about, the spiritual path becomes a non-negotiable. And, and may the last thing I'll say here, this is just, this is a really great question, uh, Richard. So thank you for this. Um, so two big things I see with, with individuals is people don't know how to stay and people are afraid of feeling. And if you want to abide in the awakened state, you have to be comfortable feeling everything. And you have to know how to stay put. You have to be stubborn in a good way <laughs> and flexible in a different kind of way. So anyways, a beautiful question. Uh, here's a question uh, from Ivy. Hi, Craig, can you speak about how we miss obvious prayers or questions being answered. I had an epiphany after we spoke the other day and I thought, huh, that was right in front of my face. I asked and I received, and I resisted. <laughs> I love it. That's the story of the ego. I asked, I received, and I resisted. And so um, can you speak to how we miss obvious prayers or questions being answered? Um, yeah. 
so this this comes down to um, this teaching I speak about of you have to know which voice to listen to. As human beings, we are literally biologically wired to listen to the loudest voice in our head. The loudest voice. That's the voice of the fight or flight freeze response. And as spiritual practitioners, we have to learn to listen to the quietest yet truest voice in our being, in our being. And so um, I'll tell a silly story about uh, my good friend Doodles. So, uh, you know, just right before uh, class tonight, I took my little dogs out for a walk and uh, my older dog, Doodles, He's a little bit stubborn and um, he doesn't always listen to me. He's kind of a space cadet. And so I took him for a little walk and uh, I saw a big truck coming. So I live out in the country and people drive these, you know, giant uh, diesel trucks, like, you know, big Ford F-350 or whatever. And I said, Doodles, come here, come here, come here. And I was, you know, like off, off the road. And he was standing in the middle of the road and he just wouldn't come. He's, he's like, no, I'm the boss. I'm going to be stubborn. And so I say, doodles, come here. And I start raising my voice, like, come here, because I don't want him getting, you know, run over. So that's when you drive these big trucks. Uh, I used to drive big trucks. You can't see because you're so high up. It's hard to see, you know, like little, little animals, <laughs> little children. <laughs> One of my friends actually ran over a kid in a parking lot in one of these big trucks. The kid was fine, but just it's just to make the point. Um, and so I started yelling. I'm like, doodles, get over here. And so what he did was he just froze. You know, because I raised my voice and I must have scared him because I was trying to let him know it was something serious. <laughs> and he literally froze right under uh, the truck. So the truck came to a stop and, you know, here was the big truck tire and here was Doodle's body. So he just like cowered right under the truck. But he was, you know, he was staring at me. He was thinking he was going to get a beaten or something. Like, Doodles, come on. <laughs> so I go and I have to scoop him up and, you know, tell the, the rancher, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But see, we, we listen to the loudest voice within us. We don't listen to the voice that is awake. And when Doodles is awake, he can see that his good friend Craig loves him and cares about him and wants him, you know, over here where it's safe. And so our egos are stubborn. They're just stubborn. And we're literally trained to listen to the loud voice in our head, not the quiet voice. And so when you say a prayer, the prayer is always answered just in this gentle voice. It'll come like a wind. It's like this flow. This is the truth. Let me show you. But we don't listen to that. We listen to the voice of our wounded self, our habitual nature, our programmed nature, our conditioned nature. We listen to our fight or flight response. And so we have to train ourselves. And this is why meditation is so important. Is in meditation, it's literally the art of listening. You're listening to the sound of your being. You're listening to the sound of silence. And in this space, you begin to hear the voice of God. And again, it doesn't show up with trumpets and angels. Maybe once in your lifetime, it may show up like that, but uh, it will show up, you know, just this sweet innocence. This sweet innocence. And you know it when you hear it. 
and just like anyone, you know, um, I, I can say this. I once had a job where I worked with people who were, I'll just say this, troublemakers. You know, <laughs> society might call them criminals or whatever, but I'll just call them troublemakers. And they tell me just ask one of the guys, like, hey, did you know that what you were doing was, before I could even say wrong, they would say, oh, yeah, I knew it. Okay, and so it's like, okay good. <laughs> so if you know that, can you listen to that voice next time? And that's a big part, you know, going back to Richard's question of mastery is listening to the right voice. And the more you listen to the quietest voice within you, paradoxically, ironically, the more powerful you become. Yet the more you listen to the voice of your ego, the more weak you become. The more weak you become. And then you just repeat your past. You just repeat the past. So the more you listen to the quietest voice inside, the more powerful you become. And the more you, you listen to the loudest voice inside, the more weak you become. And boy, is that a great lesson to learn. So if you want to be powerful, if you want to live your truth, you have to listen to the quietest voice, the voice of innocence. And it won't steer you wrong. It won't steer you wrong. Just looking on the Facebook wall, people are saying hi from Kentucky. Uh, hello, <laughs> Mary in Kentucky. That's my home state there. And uh, hello from Bali. I'd love to be in Bali someday. <laughs> so hello to you all. Um, here's a question. Uh, Neil, well, Neil in Ireland is telling me it's the middle of the night. Hi, Neil. Uh, hello, Craig. I have been in Kundalini process since 2015. My system is full of so much Shakti um and it's playing out all night my grandson a three-year-old sleeps over once a week and sleeps in the crook of my arm do you think that this energy could have um let's see if i can make this work an impact on his system thank you for your work yeah your energy has an effect on everyone's system um So when you have a lot of spiritual presence moving through your body, through your nervous system, whether it's kundalini, whether it's vast, spacious peace, whatever it is, it's, it affects the people around you. It affects them. You know, and I have this, this um, funny experience. Um, yesterday, I took my uh, five-year-old or my six-year-old daughter and my wife uh, rock climbing. And when my, my six-year-old hangs out just with me, she becomes attuned to me. She becomes very quiet, receptive. She doesn't talk much. And we just have a sweet time together. When my wife's there, um, My, my five-year-old or my six-year-old, she connects to the energy of my wife, which is much more, you know, of an excited energy. And so then my six-year-old's just talking constantly, nonstop. And I told him you know, the other day, I'm like, hey, honey, you drive daddy a little bit crazy because whenever you hang out with mom, dad, with mom and dad, both at the same time, she tends to get just really excited. And just she just talks, talks, she's a little uh, chatterbox. And so she attunes to my wife. And so we all just pick up on whatever energy where we are around. Now, tree, it, it only becomes a problem if the child is ridiculously empathetic and ridiculously sensitive. Now, most children are incredibly empathetic. They feel everything that's happening in their parents or their aunts and uncles, whoever they're with. But if... Um, if the child isn't super sensitive, um, you know, it won't be such a big deal. It won't be such a big deal. And, you know, Michelle 
writes, wondering if this will evoke Kundalini in him or could there be adverse effects? Uh, more often than not, there's, there's not much of an effect, you know, in the child. And you, you have to keep in mind here that, um, that God is in charge of the awakening process. And, you know, if God wants the Kundalini to awaken in a child, it will. But don't walk around thinking that you're going to damage your kid if you have a lot of energy in your body. And the kid comes and, you know, sleeps over or something. You know, if anything, it'll just be like the kids on, on sugar, you know, just gets a little amped up and is bouncing off the walls. But big picture, no. Um, ultimately speaking, uh, Kundalini is a healing energy. Um, and I've worked with thousands and thousands of people, and I've only heard one mother complain um, that when they stopped sleeping, because the Kundalini was so intense at night, that their child also stopped sleeping, and this created a difficulty in the family. Now, out of, again, thousands and thousands of individuals I've worked with only one time have I heard there being a difficult difficulty, and I don't even know if it's absolutely the case. That's the kundalini. Just kids know that if their parents are anxious, the kid oftentimes feels anxious just because we're empathetic creatures, and so it could simply have been that. Uh, big picture, I would not worry about it. Um, I would just relax and the more relaxed you become in their presence, the better for you and the better for them. But just to trust, just to trust tree. That's a great question. And the, the other thing too is you can always just look at the kid and see like as long as the kid's falling asleep, I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't worry about, it. you know, uh, I tell this silly story that when my Kundalini woke up, uh, no one could touch me for about, um, I'll just say six months. It got really intense. And my little girl, she'd come and touch me. And anytime anyone touched me, I'd start to have like these, you know, like these shaking seizures kind of thing. And my brain would stop and it got really weird. And if anything, you know, my daughter was like, geez, dad, you traumatized me because <laughs> I thought my dad was going crazy or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, me and my older daughter, we have a great relationship. We joke about it now. It's become a joke. And, uh, you know, so it's something we can smile about it. Anyways, okay. Let's see here. Um, I have a couple more questions from email here. Uh, this is from Ananda. Hi, Craig. I have a strong inner resistance to experience painful thoughts and feelings. I don't understand willingness and surrender. Can you explain clearly how you do it? Yeah. I have a strong inner resistance to experience painful thoughts and feelings. So with, with painful thoughts, um, painful thoughts can be a slippery slope. And for the majority of my teaching, I don't recommend anyone engage in any kind of thinking. <laughs> and so I want to say that again. I really don't engage, you know, invite anyone to engage in any type of thinking. So if you have something painful in your body, don't think about that pain. In fact, thinking or engaging in painful thoughts tends to perpetuate. It just takes like a, a, a little bit of pain and it draws it out. Like you can, you can think about a painful experience for 20 years. But Surrender is what your question is about is, can you explain clearly how to, to surrender? Surrender basically is synonymous with feeling. 
So can you feel what's there? There's this funny thing that happens with, with mammals. The way a mammal is wired is when a mammal feels something fully, the body spontaneously releases it. And then the thinking about it stops because the thing is gone. So as a mammal, which is you know an aspect of ourself, if you can give yourself permission to breathe into the pain, and, and I'll explain that clearly, <laughs> that was your question, can you feel the felt sensation of the pain itself? So say, for example, I'm feeling immense anger. My job is to feel the sensations of anger. So what is the sensations of anger? Oftentimes it's tension in the belly. Oftentimes it's heat. Sometimes it can be the blood boiling. If I engage with the thoughts, I could just spend, you know, six hours just engaging, arguing with no one <laughs> but my head. <laughs> you just argue with a fan, you know, having a fantasy argument in my head is what I mean by that. But if I simply feel the heat and the blood boiling, and that what I like to do with anger is I just like to imagine that anger just exploding out of me like a volcano and exploding into the vastness of the sky, the peacefulness of the room. And with that will come visions, you know, of destruction and death or whatever, you know, if it's rage. So again, let's make it real simple. You're, you're on, let's say, I-5 in California sitting in traffic, the traffic opens up, you get the breakaway, and then someone cuts you off and throws you back into, you know, a mess of traffic again. And so you sit there, and if you immediately start thinking about that person who cuts you off, that's not going to help you. That's not surrender. So don't engage with the painful thought but do engage with a painful feeling. Breathe into the feeling of dread, the feeling of anger. And you can invite those visions to come forward of you going up and punching them in the face or whatever, but don't engage it. You can just let the vision come and you let it go. And you let it empty out of you. You let it come, you let it go, you let it empty out. And you breathe through it as long as it takes. You breathe into that heat. You breathe into your temper. You breathe into the fire. As long as it takes until, those fi until that fire you know, burns all the way down to coals. And the coals just turn into dust. So something with like rage that may be a hundred breaths. It may be a thousand breaths maybe 10,000, <laughs> depending on how intense it is. You know, if it's emotionally painful, oftentimes when you give yourself permission to cry, to grieve, it empties out of you. You know, um, at dinner tonight, we were talking about my father uh, who died about five years ago. And um, and my wife was just, we were talking about someone who was at the funeral. And I said, well, I don't remember them there. And and my wife said, yeah, because you were mourning. <laughs> you know, like you were grieving. <laughs> you know, in my head, my, my fingers and my hair, my head just down, just tears pouring. And that's what, that's surrender. That's surrender. You know, but me sitting there and thinking painful thoughts like, geez, it's not fair that my da dad died so young. It's not fair that he died now. It's not fair that he didn't get to be the grandfather I wanted him to be to, m to my little girl, Ani. That's not surrender. Surrendering is just giving yourself permission to feel what's within you. And then what you notice is if you just trust the process, anything painful in you will empty out. 
And then you're just left with what remains. And what remains is, you know, our inquiry question for this week. What is your experience of being? Being is that which is here all the time. But most of us cannot see and feel and experience the presence of our being because we are too full emotionally. Because like Ananda's writing, we don't know how to, we don't clearly know how to surrender. So a willingness to surrender Ananda means you have to be a little bit crazy. So the wiring of your biology on an ego, egoic protectionist level is I fight or I run or I freeze. I do my best to avoid painful emotions. And so I'm asking you to be crazy and doing, do something that 95% of the population doesn't do is to step out of the, the psychological wiring and step into the biological wiring, which says, oh yeah, I'm in pain. How about I fall on my knees in child's pose and just grieve? And then after I do that, I get up and I notice my mind is empty. <laughs> it works like magic. The more you cry, the emptier you, you will be. But if you cry and think simultaneously, then you can work yourself into um, hysteria. You become hysterical. But if you grieve without thinking, you become free. Because you're letting go of all the pain. Pain is what veils your consciousness. Same is true with anger. If you give yourself permission to be angry without thinking, and then without acting, because anger is a dangerous one. <laughs> if we have anger with action, oftentimes we can get in a fight or trouble. But if you have anger without thinking, it empties out of you. And this very powerful force which veiled your light is now gone. And you'll be left with power and freedom. Through the doorway of grief, you open into uh, compassion and freedom, tenderness and freedom, innocence and freedom. It's a wonderful doorway. Great question here. Um, so one more thing. Um, let, let's see if anyone else has a question. I think I did my best to get to all the questions. Um, One thing I wanted to comment on is uh, during our Wednesday night meditation, I invited uh, people to share their experience during the meditation practice. And um, you know, t here's, here's uh, one from um, Denny. Uh, Denny writes, uh, Craig, it's still a challenge for me to let awareness settle into my heart. It comes in spurts, usually accompanied by some nausea and disorientation. Feels like it requires a different sort of letting go and surrender than um, compared to the, the headspace. So this is true. That's a, that's a beautiful um, a reflection, Danny. To come into the heart, you have to be comfortable with feeling. And I've said this often, but most people in their heart, they use their heart as like a, a dumping ground for their emotional pain. So don't think that that's uh, only happening in you, Danny. Uh, most people stuff their pain in their heart. And so then when, you know, someone silly like me says, hey, when you feel into your heart, right away you might be like, oh, I, this does not feel good. <laughs> this does not feel good to be in my heart. And so then we say, I'm going to go back to my, my safe space, you know, up here, you know, where it's vast, spacious, and free in my head um, because you've realized that aspect of truth. And so I'm going to invite you, Danny, not to be discouraged. 
you know, to give yourself permission to feel more, to sit with that nausea. And a great question is say, like if you find something in your heart, nausea, pain, anger, sadness, whatever, to imagine that nausea is a little child, like a little child who's feeling sick. And you just ask them like, hey buddy, like what's going on? Why are you feeling nauseous? What's this about? And he'll show you, he might show you like an old memory from childhood, an old wound. Um, nausea oftentimes has to do with, um, well, one, nausea could be purely um, burning up. But when light comes into contact with old pain, oftentimes there's a feeling of nausea. The nausea is just like burning it up. Um, and other times, uh, when someone has been manipulative in our life, we can feel a sense of nausea there. And when we repress nausea, it, it tend, uh, when we repress someone's manipulative behavior, it often festers in us in the form of nausea. So, um, well, Denny, you, you have your hand up. So, yeah, you want to ask a question? Yeah, say hi, Danny. Let's see if we can hear you. I'm gonna. Are you, I think if you're unmuted, Danny, are you unmuted? Yeah, I can't hear you. Okay, you'll type the question. If you want, Danny. Um, if you go down to the bottom of the screen where you see the little video camera, it's got that carrot next to it. You hit the little up carrot. Um, you can see what your audio setting is. If you want to see if you can find your mic that way, or you can just write it in the chat and I'll see if it pops up. But, you know, you know, while he's uh, putting together his question or figuring out the technology, You know, I can remember just sitting with nausea for years on the path. And it's, it's a good sign that it's coming into the light. And so sometimes if you sit in your heart and, you, and you're feeling nausea, that means your heart is awake. And it's liter literally beginning to burn up some of that old pain. It's literally healing that wound. And it's very common um, when we um, it's very common that when we feel into that nausea, when we open into something, we become disoriented. Disor being disoriented is often a hallmark that you've stepped into a new realm. And so it's a good sign. Some people, they get really nervous when they feel disoriented. And um, I encourage you to, to smile, you know, <laughs> if you feel disoriented and to have a sense of like, woo, you know, like almost like, you know, if you're a drinker and you had your first beer, you're like, woo, you know, I'm excited, I'm drinking. Or, you know, if you smoke pot or something, it's like, woo, you know, like you're starting to become disoriented. It's you're shifting from one state of consciousness to another. There's a feeling of groundlessness in it. It's, all, it's a good sign that you're changing states. So this is what Denny writes. It also feels like stepping into, which is different than a backward step. Yeah, so most people, when they, when they step into the transcendent, it's a backward step. It's a stepping into freedom. But if you're going to be in this world, you have to step down into. You have to choose to incarnate. And so, you know, there's the freedom from, you know, like you step, you know, you're free from life, you step out of life. That's the freedom of the monk. But then if we want to become a master, we have to step down into our life. And that means down into the heart, down into the belly. Uh, that's a good um, reflection, Daddy. Yes, yeah, so we have to step into and so if you want to be a master, if you want your awakened state of consciousness to abide, you have to claim it. You have to be here. 
and say, yes, I'm going to be here. I'm going to feel what's here. I'm going to experience what's here. Taking the backward step out of life, that's easy. <laughs> that's easy. Now, most people, if they could do that, that'd be a huge step forward. If our world could do that, you know, it would be great. <laughs> It'd be great peace here on planet Earth if we could just step back. And so first we step back and that gives us clarity of mind, a sense of freedom, a realization, oh yeah, I'm not, you know, this human character. I'm something much greater. Something much greater. And then the question is, is, can you step into that greater and allow that greater to manifest here on planet Earth? But the price, you know, price to admission is stepping into that which is greater and living it means you have to face all the confused, wounded, hurt aspects of self. All the places that were repressed and to meet them with love. And as we do so, we develop mastery. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for sharing, Danny. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Let's see if I did my part. Um, yeah, looks like I got the questions to the best of my ability. If I forgot any of your questions, you feel free to send them to me again. Um, again, a gentle reminder about the new YouTube series and a, a couple more of those that, um, that are on my computer. I just need to edit and get published. Great, uh, big thank you to all you uh, offering donations and support uh, for the channel, for the teaching, for the Sangha, for, you know, pay for the technology uh, to put this together. It's, it's greatly helpful. You know, they're trickling in. Sometimes they're just in real small amounts, but all of it adds up and, you know, helps me to continue to do this work. And so I appreciate that greatly. And again, an invitation, if any of you uh, want to meet on the Wednesday night meditation, it's a longer than normal sit. You know, we sit for, you know, 55 minutes to an hour. I know most groups sit for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. But it's good to push the envelope, at least once a week to push the envelope. I used to do a sit every um, Sunday for three hours. Nobody would come. <laughs> Nobody would come. Be me and like two or three other people, and even they would, you know, a lot of times only come for half of it or something. And heck, I used to sit every day for three or four hours. And um, you know, there's a real shift that can happen, a real quiet strength that takes place. And uh, you know, out of all the hours in our day, we do so much random, silly, nonsense kind of stuff. I encourage you to take a leap every now and then once a week and sit for an hour and see what shows up. You know, the grace definitely pours in and it's very healing and even overwhelming, but it's overwhelming good, <laughs> overwhelming good. So uh, that's my invitation to you all. Uh, so much love to each and every one of you and respect just for sitting and showing up sharing your hearts with me. So have a wonderful night and bye for now. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.